and love and esteem. And then we have those self-fulfillment or what they call spiritual needs. And so we've talked about already before. I'm going to put on something a little bit on my feet. Because it's a little chilly. We talked before about... Um, okay, attention. <laughs> we talked about how we had some safety needs, our basic needs, you know, safety and security, physiological needs, and then we had our psychological needs, and then we had our spiritual needs, achieving your full potential, including all creative activities, right? And so the next thing I want to show you is that in order to meet these needs, we know that we had to not be anxious for anything, don't worry about stuff, um, don't think about whatever may be trying to come against you or come and attack you. Not to say you don't notice it, but don't dwell on it, right? Because sometimes after something has happened and five minutes has passed, guess what? That's five minutes ago. Time continues to press forward. So you deal with it as quickly as you possibly can. You change your, 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 your mindset. You focus on something different. And then do pray without ceasing. This is how you do it. Learn to be content. We talked about being satisfied with your life, being satisfied with yourself. And learn how to rejoice in the Lord. Even in the midst of turmoil and transition, learning how to be thankful for even the little things. Sometimes when you say thank you to the Lord, yes. It just seems like your perception just automatically changes. It's not even really the circumstances so much, but it's more or less your perception of the thing because you know that no matter what is happening in this situation, God is going to get the glory out of my life with this. So I'm going to say thank you now for what's getting ready to happen. Does that make sense? So this is how you get God to fulfill the need, and then you will have the virtues that the desire that the father desires that you should have so we last week we talked about one of the virtues right which was hope and the way that we got to hope is that we have to trust in God and begin to change our language. And you remember the scriptures, some of you got some of those scriptures. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength, and I will not lean on my own understanding. Because there are some things that we just don't understand. Yes. We don't know why things happen. We don't know why things happen the way that they happen. We don't know why our family members are going through the way that they're going through. But if we just learn how to trust in the Lord and not lean to, but we've had our trust broken in some times. There have been some things that we didn't know that, you know, that, that people have broken our trust. We thought that we could trust, but this is why God says, don't put your trust and your hope in chariots or in horses, but trust in the Lord. Trust in the truth of God's word. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. So our language begins to change. We start to say things that I'm confident. I believe. I have faith in this. I am certain. Even though we can't explain it, I'm still certain that God will show up. He will prevail. He will get us through. And I have assurance, blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. We sang today, I am a friend of God. Right? Yes. And so those are our convictions. Those are our credences. Those are our reliances. And so our language begins to change and becomes more because we begin to gain the virtue of hope in God. Make sense? Okay. Where did I go? So now, today, we're going to talk about autonomy versus shame. The second stage on Eric Erickson's uh, theory of adult development. He has the psychosocial crisis. The psychosocial crisis is autonomy versus shame. And the virtue to be gained is the will. Now, a lot of times, we've lost our will. Some of us have lost our will because we've been shamed so much. The people have made us think that we have made mistakes in life. And I, 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 I say, yes, we have made mistakes, but Here's the thing I want you to change the language because I try not to use that word anymore, mistakes. Because, and look, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just go to see if I got it here. Let me tell you what it is. 
Autonomy is the freedom from external control or influence. It's a certain level of independence. It's a certain level of self-governing. It's being able to control yourself. It's being able to have a set of principles within your own mind or within your own spirit that will say, mm, I don't think I should have that piece of chocolate cake because the doctor said that I'm this close to sugar diabetes. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So it's a knowledge coupled with will. Now this is the will. So this is willpower that we're trying to build here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so now, but shame is a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the conscious of wrong or foolish behavior. Now, there is some wrong in some foolish behavior. Some of us have, some people have told us, no, you're bad. You know, we tell kids, you're a bad kid. Is there really a bad such a thing as a bad child? Or is it our own impatience? So a lot of times people will shame or try to throw shame on us because of their own impatience or their own stuff that's going on with inside of them. And so what I want us to do is that as long as we know that we have a certain level of autonomy, then we don't have a reason to feel shame. Now let me just tell you what the Lord says. I don't know if you can see this, but here's the one. Here's the reason why I said that there should be no shame and we have to go, is it really a mistake? Now here's the thing. When you belong to Christ, Romans 8 and 1 says, now there is no condemnation to them who are what? Yeah. In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The spirit is what governs us now. The spirit of God's word, the truth of everything that we've been through, everything that has made us who we are right now today, even the stuff that people would call mistakes. God doesn't call it a mistake. He calls it life experience. Because here's the thing. You survived it. Yeah. Yes, they hurt you. Yes, they cussed you out. Yes, they mistreated you. But here you are, right now today, still able to lift your hands, still able to hold your head up, still able to put on your own clothes and, and get yourself dressed in the morning, still able to put a little color on your lips or, or whatever. I don't know what y'all do. Put a little aftershave, you know, or whatever. Right? Here you are, still doing it. Right? But sometimes the enemy will try to come in, and here's the thing, not in our own, in our own, like a, a conversation. Sometimes people in conversation will do that. Remember when you was this? Remember when you was that? Oh, here's the one I really love, y'all. When they, when they see me and I say something like, you need to go get a job. They'll say, well, you're supposed to be a pastor. I, exactly. That's why I'm telling you this. But what I'm trying to say is they would try to shame me as though I was not supposed to say that to them or that I'm supposed to be so nice and friendly and skipping through the flowers. I don't think that's where God created me to be. And so I've accepted it. I've accepted it. I'm telling you the truth. Right? And it comes right into the next one. He says, but we don't walk after the flesh, but by the spirit. When the Holy Spirit gives you something or tells you something, that's when you say something. Remember what Granny said. My Granny, she told me, she said, if the spirit doesn't give you anything to say, don't say anything. Sometimes silence speaks the loudest. Amen. And so here's the thing. Sometimes when you don't say anything, people will say, well, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you stand up for it? You're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be this. You're supposed to be that. And try to throw shame and make us feel guilty about things. But here's the thing. It's not, here's, let me just tell you. Here's the virtue that God wants to, you, us to pick up. Remember, the virtue is will. When our will fails, we pick up the will of God. Does that make sense? It's the will of God that now needs to come up. When people try to throw shame, and it seems like sometimes, sometimes to argue with them is really a fight against their will and your will, right? What they want because of the way they're feeling, whether they're feeling shame or whatever, and then the way you're feeling. And so when it's a fight against the will, when you're coming into a conflict with the will of someone else, am I making sense? Y'all say amen. Amen. Okay. So when you're coming into conflict with someone else, 
It's not my will, but thy will be done. Help me to pick up your will, Lord. Why? Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm going somewhere. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. When people have tried to shame us, when people have tried to say this is your past, this is your history, this is where you came from, how could you possibly be who you are today? Because I know where you used to be, right? Oh God. He says, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The good news is I'm still alive today. That whatever was designed to take me out, no weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. That's what the good news is. The good news is I didn't lose my mind. The good news is that I'm not, I'm, a, I'm able to get up. I'm able to put on some eyelashes. Thank God. Thank Jesus. <laughs> And brush my hair. <laughs> Where some people would not do this. See, you, you got to remember, it's the needs of the psychological mind. It's the needs of the spiritual mind. It's the needs. And God meets each and every one of our needs and gives us these virtues. Am I making sense yeah. now? Yes. And so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm keep asking you that because I want to make sure you're getting where, because sometimes it blows my own mind. I want to make sure I'm saying it right. And so he says, he says, to everyone who does what? Believes. So that goes back to where we had to start. Trust, hope, faith, assurance. To everyone who believes, you have no reason now to be ashamed. Amen. He says first to the Jew. That's first to the church. First to the community and the believers of the way. Right? And then to the Gentile. Because what happens is, as the world starts to see us living... And us throwing off the shame and throwing off the mistrust and throwing off the guilt and gaining the virtues of God. Now the people outside now see and they say, now what must I do to be saved? What must I do now to live this life like you, to have this type of freedom that you have? Now what do I have to do? And that's when you can say, I once was a wretch undone. I once had a lot of chaos in my life. There were some things that happened, some traumas that happened, some conflicts that happened in my life. But God. Amen. Amen. But God. Woo. But God. Jesus. But God. Here it is. When you're going through autonomy versus shame and you're trying to pick up the will of God, the one thing I want you to leave with today is to embrace your story. Amen. Amen. There's a, I don't know if you, anybody watched The Passion of the Christ? Passion of the Christ, you seen it? And remember when Jesus was carrying the cross and he held it tight and the man said, why are you embracing your cross? Why are you embracing the thing that they're getting ready to hang you out on, that they're mocking you for? Why are you embracing it? And he says, and, and I just, I, I, I got that, and I had to say it to myself. And I don't know, I was having a conversation, and I said, why are you embracing your story? Why are you embracing the thing that is going to be the level of mocking and people can use as mock? and ridicule. And I said, because God is going to get the glory in the end. I'm going to embrace and hug my cross. I'm going to embrace my story. I'm going to embrace all of the hard times, all of the sleepless nights, all of the tears. Why? Because now I can use this story as the gospel that God is still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still a bridge over troubled waters. He still makes a way out of nowhere. How do you know? Because I'm standing here today. When you embrace your story, God will redeem it. Redeem means to make good use of. You know, those five cent bottles after it's empty. You take it back, hey God, to the manufacturer. And you get something in exchange that is worth something. Here's what God, hey God, is telling me to do. He says, if you bring your emptiness, if you bring your shame, if you bring your mistress, if you bring those things to me after they have used it up, drank it up, everything, bring your empty self to me and I will redeem your story. I will give you something. Woo! The pastor preach 
preaching today? Yes. <laughs> God will redeem what people have tried to shame you with. He will redeem the shame of your story. And so redemption in Christian theology refers to the deliverance of Christians from sin. Most evangelical theologians and Protestant denominations reject Origen's argument that God paid the ransom price of redemption to Satan. When God, well this is, and this is the thing, when Christ was put on the cross as a Passover lamb, as a, and his blood was shed to cover a multitude of sins, whatever people are trying to tell you to bring shame to your life, you tell them it's covered by the blood. Amen. That Christ died for my sins. For whatever you think you're going to hold me hostage with, Christ has released me. He has loosed the chain. And I am in Christ. I am a new creature now. So therefore, there's no condemnation. See, I had to give you these scriptures because when the enemy comes in to try to attack you, even when it doesn't have to come from somebody else, sometimes it comes from you. So you have to be not of the flesh, but of the spirit. So let me just see that I put another one here. There it is. Isaiah, here it is. Embrace your story. Isaiah 44 and 22. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. Your sins like the morning mist. Did y'all see the morning mist this morning rising up and dissipating into the air? All of the stuff that people have tried to hold. God said, I'm sweeping it away. Sometimes when you just in worship, just wave it just like God is just sweeping it away. So long. Bye-bye. Goodbye to the pain and the sorrow. So long. And like a cloud. He said, I swept it away like a cloud. Your sins like the morning mist. He says, return to me. Because I have redeemed you. Everything in your story, I'm making it good. Anything anybody got to say? Wave it away. Here's our favorite, Psalms 107 and 2. In certain texts it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But he says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Whatever's coming against you. Whatever it is, tell your story. It's your truth. It's the gospel. You still here? Still living? Still breathing? Still moving? Still can do your little shaky dance if you needed to? And so let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Now, this goes into something else, and I just want to lock this, block this in your mind. There's something called the talking cure. And we'll get into that later on if y'all want to hear about it. It's called the talking cure. And so it's something, I got to remember who the philosopher was, but it was something, it's a lady named Anna O. And the more you talk, the better you get. But here's what I want to do. Before you start talking your cure, let me give you the language. This is the language. Speak scripture. <coughs> Speak spiritual hymns and psalms to yourself. Amen? Because faith comes by yeah. hearing and hearing by. Okay, and so if you talking and ain't nobody else in the room, who's listening? You. <laughs> so speak over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Speak scriptures to your situations. Am I making sense what I'm saying? Okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, let me see what I got. I think that's the last slide. Y'all might be ready to say amen. Oh, here it is. Yep, that was the last slide. So embrace your story because people will try to have you not know the will, your will, for your life and God's will. And he says, I know the plans that I have for you. I know my will for you. He says, eyes have not seen, nor have ears heard, nor have they entered into the heart of man to know God's purpose and plan for your life. He says, here's the thing. If you have lost your will, then I'm going to redeem you with mine. My will for your life. Does that make sense? Do you receive it? Amen. Say amen. It's not amen. 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 God will do it. Next week, we're going to focus on purpose. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Where are we? 
And if you want any of these slides, please email me and I will share them with you. If that's all right, all right? Okay, good. All right, so we respond to grace. Here's 